So enough of the commercials. I'm delighted to welcome our first speaker today, uh, Axelos Amir, brand manager, Luis Ribeiro, with a fascinating personal take on the benefits of idle based service management. His session entitled Reaching Everest Base Camp with Idle 4. Hand over to you, Luis. Thank you. Excellent, Mark. And hello, everyone. I am going to share my screen. So I believe you can now see my screen. Well, uh, Mark, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this uh, forum. And everyone, thank you for coming and, and attending this session. Um, my name is uh, Luis Rivero, and I work as a regional brand manager for Axelos. I will explain in a second what my role is at Axelos. Um, normally, I will be in the introduction slide, I would be uh, having a picture of myself in a suit. However, as today I'm going to share my personal experience in the mountains, I found this picture to be more suitable for the occasion. In fact, this is me in Everest Base Camp. Um, just to manage expectations, I didn't go to the top of Everest. That's too difficult and too expensive. I just managed to get to base camp. Uh, and I will show you my personal experience how uh, either four concepts and elements were used to reach uh, Everest base camp. Uh, two important things to know about me before I, I start the session is, first of all, I have no IT experience at all. Um, I, I think I believe I'm the only one in this group that has very little IT experience, but you will understand a, a, a more in the next slide of why this is relevant. And secondly, as you can imagine, I have passion for mountaineering. And, and again, in the next slide, uh, you will understand why I'm mentioning these two uh, concepts. So this is my personal experience, and I will speak about how me as a client interact with a service provider but then I will speak from the service provider point of view, how the service provider uh, created and supported the service of taking people to the mountain. But first of all, setting the scene, why I came up with this topic, why I'm speaking about mountains, service management, idle, and so on. So as I said, I work for Axelos, and I believe the majority of you are familiar with Axelos. Axelos is the organization that is, I define the, the guardian of ITIL. Basically, we own, but we maintain, and we make sure that the ITIL is relevant, maintaining the books, exams, syllabus, and so on. And my role at Axelos basically focuses on engaging with organizations, with governments, and ensure that those organizations understand the value of ITIL and other best practice uh, products. And I have to say, I have been doing training in ITIL. I have been very often speaking to our experts, uh, but I didn't have, and I still don't have the IT experience of, of adopting a ITIL. And of course, when, when, when I, we look at best practice, I said it would be great if I could have the experience of me using that best practice, because it would be easier than to explain those concepts to organizations and, and governments. Um, so then I said, why don't we bring this best practice into a personal experience? And there's a misconception that ITIL is about IT. And in fact, ITIL is about IT service, man sorry, about service management. Service management is important in IT, but as long as we're providing a service, as long as we're interacting with a service, there's so many elements of ITIL that are relevant. So I said, yeah, I'm happy to adopt and use ITIL in one of our personal experience and see how it's in the real world. So I decided to use my, my, my hobbies, mountaineering, uh, and see how idle concepts would be um, uh, applied in this type of um, activity. So yeah, I came up with this presentation, which is going to show you, um, a, a, it's going to be a journey. It's going to be a journey through the service value chain, but also a journey through the Himalayas, through the mountains. So the agenda or the structure of this presentation is going to be as follows. First part is going to be my customer journey. Me as a customer, how I interacted with the service provider and um, all those uh, interactions that we had. Secondly, uh, is going to be from the service provider perspective, how the service provider created and supported the services, in this case, track services. And finally, we're going to use a very important concept of ITIL4, which is value co-creation. 
we're going to answer the question, was value co-created after that customer journey, after the creation and the support of the, of the services, was value co-created? Was the customer happy with the value that received? Was the uh, service provider happy with the value co-created? We will get to that in, at the end. So I said, it's going to be a journey divided in three different uh, parts. Uh, I'm under the assumption that uh, uh, you are already familiar with the service value chain, which is one of the key elements of ITER4, which basically shows all the interconnected activities that we need in order to convert demand into value. Now let's start with the, the presentation and let's start with the first um, um, part or the first steps in, in the service value chain, which is that, that step between demand and engagement. How the client, in this case myself, is engaging, is communicating with the service provider. So my personal experience, and, and for that, uh, the, I'm going to use this customer journey diagram that we find in one of the idle books. That book is a DSV or Drive to Stakeholder Value. Uh, the, the book focuses a lot on, on this area, the customer journey. So we'll highlight how my customer journey was uh, to acquire the service. So, as I said, I'm a big fan of mountaineering and I was one day surfing on, on Facebook and I saw one of my friends who posted a picture of him at base camp, and Everest base camp, and I found it very interesting and very cool. So at that point I said to myself, I have to do this. That's the mandate that I sent to myself. I have to go to base camp because this is something really cool. Uh, at that point it started an exploration phase, trying to look at different providers who could offer the service. It, and here, well, I use the internet a lot and uh, referrals. I asked him, actually my friend gave me a referral who he did this uh, trip with uh, so I can engage with them. After doing that exploration phase, looking at different options, I engaged with a couple of uh, suppliers, but specifically with one supplier who was actually the organization or the company that provided the, the track service to my friend. And we started building a relationship. We started uh, uh, getting to know each other we added even on WhatsApp, we're changing messages by email, by Facebook. So I was having a better understanding how they operate, all the things that they do. And of course, they were understanding me, they were understanding me as a client, as a customer. Then at that point, I was quite happy to get the services with them. So they sent me a proper offer where they highlighted all the requirements, all the items that were going to be included in the, um, uh, in the trip and they did it via email. Then it was me basically uh, with agreement, basically me telling them, yes, I'm taking the services with you. And for that, I had to do a deposit of 10% of the total fees uh, to the bank account. So at that point, it was confirmed that I was going to do this trip. However, before, before we start using the service or start using the service, there is a step in between, which is onboarding. And onboarding shows all those activities that I need to prepare before I go and take the service. In this case, uh, those activities were around emails, um, sorry, about blogs of people who did a uh, Everest Base Camp in the, in the past. So some kind of preparation of what to expect from my end. And also a list or a checklist of items that I need to bring to the mountains. So all that preparation that I needed before I went to the mountains. And then the next two steps, uh, co-create and realize, uh, those are going to focus later in the presentation, those steps, because we're going to use the service value chain to explain how value was co-created and if there was a, a realization of value. Um, but something important to highlight here is the following. By these interactions with the service provider and myself, we got to know each other. So they knew the things that I wanted. They knew that I liked photography. They knew, I knew how they operated. I knew how other customers uh, uh, perceived their services. So we got to know each other. And that uh, dotted line, great uh, line, is what we call the band of visibility. By these interactions, they got to know me a bit more and I got to know them a little bit more as well. And that's extremely important because the more that they know me, the more that I know them, the easier it's going to be to co-create value. So we will see at the end if value was co-created in this case. So, as I said, at this point, I sent my deposit. I was preparing myself uh, to go to the mountains. And next step was basically for me to take a, a plane and go to Nepal. 
So I'm based in London, uh, but I flew to Nepal. Um, I landed in Kathmandu, and then in Kathmandu, uh, a taxi was waiting for me uh, to take me to the hotel, and that's basically where the service uh, started. Um, now I'm going to change my point of view, and I'm going to speak on behalf of the service provider. I have a very good relationship with the service provider, so for this story, I interacted with them quite a lot, uh, but I'm going to tell you how they prepared, how they uh, created that service for me. So, as, as you can imagine then, if we go through the service value chain, the, the step is planning. How the service provider did the planning activity to decide if they were going to create the service for myself. And of course, for my wife and other people who did the service with, uh, who did the trek with me. In this case, the service provider were looking at different areas, such as what's the cost that they need to incur, what are the benefits that they're going to get, not only revenue, not only how much money the customers are going to pay me, but it's also, I'm going to have some benefits from brand awareness or other uh, criteria. Uh, they evaluate risks, they check that they have resources, so basically some kind of mini business case. They look at, at the opportunity and see if um, they have the resources and they, commercially speaking, make sense to create the service. For this activity, there are certain practices um, that support those activities, such as business analysis, financial management, and the ones that you see on the screen. So once the service provider planned those activities, I said, you know what? Yes, it, it makes sense that uh, we, we, we provide that service, we create that service for Luis. Then we went to the next step, which is basically the design and transition, sorry, the design of that service. And here's that when the service provider said, okay, fine, we have a group of people from London coming here, let's design how the service is going to be uh, given to them. So the way that they decided the service, designed the service was the following. They created four key elements of the service. One was the domestic transfers. What I mean by that is transfer from the airport into the hotel. And I will explain in a second how that works. But as I said, when I landed in Kathmandu, there was a taxi waiting for me because that's when the service started. Hotels in Kathmandu, because I spent one night, actually two nights in Kathmandu, so that was given by the service provider. Some internal flights to get to the place in the mountains where we started the trek. And of course the trek itself that included all the hotels, the restaurants, the itinerary, porters and so on. So that's a design that they did and you see in the screen some of the practices, item practices that supported these activities. I know it's easy for me to speak about these um, elements because I experienced myself so I know what I'm talking about. But if you haven't done this, um, a track might be a bit more difficult to understand the concept of these the blocks. So let me show you a couple of pictures to, to, to help you understand how the service was created. So as I said, I landed in Kathmandu. In Kathmandu, a taxi waited for me, took me to the hotel. I slept one night in the hotel. Then another taxi took me back to the airport. And from the airport, uh, we took a flight from Kathmandu, which is the, the, the capital of Nepal, to the Blue Pin, which is a place called Lukla, which is basically already in the Himalayas. We took that flight to Lukla, and I have to say one of the most dangerous airports in the world. It's just a runway, there is nothing else. This picture was taken actually from um, the plane. And as you can see, all the buildings that you see around are just houses. There's nothing, there's no airport. You get off in the, in the runway and you start the trek from, from there. So we safely landed in Lukla, thanks God. And in Lukla, the porter and the guide was waiting for us to take us to the mountains. This is what we did. Um, in fact, explaining in, 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 in the map, in the blue pin, that's Lukla. That's where we started, where we landed and we started the trek. And each uh, red uh, point indicates a village in the middle of Himalayas where we slept and uh, where we spent a, a night. And then we continue the uh, next day to another place. And we made it all the way to the Blue Pin, which is Everest Base Camp, which is 5,545 meters, no, sorry, 5,364 meters uh, uh, altitude. And for the ones who are more a fan of altitudes and, and, and time walking, this table will show you the, each of the places that we visited, how many hours we walked uh, to get to that place, 
and the altitude gained. I don't speak about five hours walk seems to be easy, but when you are walking at 4,000, 5,000 uh, meters altitude, that's very challenging. The highest altitude that we reached was Kalapatar, which is near Everest Base Camp, and it's a place where you have a wonderful view of Everest. Uh, it was a 5,545 meters um, altitude. It was very hard. Um, and then from that point, we started the descent to Lukla, um, which took two days, well, three days. So now you understand a bit more how the service um, was um, created and, and of course it, it delivered to us. Um, but going back to the service value chain uh, journey, the next step after the design was uh, obtain and build the service. They decided as you saw with the blocks and they said, okay, fine, we're going to create it in-house or uh, uh, obtain it from a, from a supplier that we were going to outsource some of the elements. So going back to these blocks, the red blocks were the activities that the service provider decided to uh, outsource or to obtain from a different uh, provider. And some of them is because of the nature of the activity. Of course, with the flights, you need that service to be provided by an airline because the service provider wouldn't have the capacity to have their own aircraft uh, or guest houses and restaurants uh, as well. So a lot of these activities uh, were outsourced just because of the nature of the activity. But the service provider concentrated on the key activities, which is the itinerary and providing a, a guide who could take us to the, top, to the base camp. And of course, he will be following any, any uh, procedures in case of an emergency. Again, in this activity, we have certain ITO practices supporting those activities, such as risk management, supply management, capacity management, and so on. So these activities are extremely important independently if you're obtaining the service or you're building it in-house. You see one of the blocks here that I speak about porters. And I want to spend one additional slide speaking about porters because this is a key element of the service. Porters are those people who help us carry the bags in the mountains. As you can imagine, because of the altitude, um, we don't have enough uh, oxygen, so it's really difficult any uh, physical activity. And these porters are very well trained, but they're basically they are from, from the mountains. And what they do for a living is they carry weight, they carry bags for us. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to carry out a 15, 20 kilos a pack unless you are extremely, extremely uh, in, a, in, a, in a very uh, fit condition. This is me actually trying to lift one of those bags. They do it with the head. In fact, it's quite impressive. And I, I took a picture, but then after that, I was done. It was very, very hard. So porters were a key element um, in, in basically creating and delivering this service. So continuing with the journey, the service provider obtained and built those components, and then they went to deliver and support the service. And deliver the service was basically, as we said, once I landed in Kathmandu, start taking me through uh, Kathmandu, through the airports, and then through the mountains, all the way to the base camp, and of course, back to, to Kathmandu, but also the, a key component is how they support the services. Because as you know, I mean, all of you are very well familiar with IT and service management. Uh, the support part is key. The services are never perfect and support is always needed. So in the Himalaya, similar to what happens in the real uh, world in, in your companies, uh, for, for, for all of you who are in this session, we face risks, we face problems, and we face incidents anytime that we are working in a service, or anytime that we're delivering a service. And I'm going to show you how the service provider were using already elements of ITO4 to address especially incidents. So these are the common incidents that you can see in, in going to the mountains uh, in Nepal. Some related to altitude sickness, that can be something like a mild headaches to all the way to edema. The demo is like a blood cloth and that can, you need immediate evacuation. You can have some walking injuries, such as blisters, strains, and so on. And you can have other category of incidents, such as jack, that animal might attack you. It's not that they attack you, it's they, they can, might push you and you might fall. Uh, rock falling and flight delays. So to show you how the service provider was dealing with incidents, I'm going to concentrate on the extreme incidents, which is the edemas cerebral or pulmonary edemas, which as I said, is a blood cloth 
in, in, in your body that needs immediate evacuation. And something that I found fascinating from this provider is that even they didn't know they were using ITO4, they were using the four dimensions of a uh, service management to uh, provide support uh, when they had an incident. So thanks God we didn't have any edema, cerebral edema or pulmonary edema in our, in our group of the trek. Uh, but speaking to them uh, after the trek, uh, they were telling me that sometimes they have those cases and they will explain to me what are the uh, areas or what are the elements or what are the activities that they do in order to uh, restore the service quite quickly. And of course, make sure that that, that person uh, has the, the care that needs and nothing serious happens. So they have a process in place where when a person not feeling well, there's going to be some kind of detection what's happening with that person. It's going to classify what the incident uh, is. It might be just a mild headache and, and that's it. But if, if there are certain symptoms that are are becoming quite serious, you're going to have a diagnose and then they're going to say, yes, this person is suffering edema. So we need, we need a resolution. In this case, a resolution is we need to evacuate this person, even by helicopter or some porter might take that person down, but that person needs to go to lower altitude so the body can, can, can recover. And what that happens, they close it and they restore the service, not with that person, because that person will be um, likely in the hospital in recovery, but they restored the service with the group of people who are going to, to base camp. So they have a process in place, but importantly, they also need to look, or they're looking at after partner suppliers. They can have a perfect process in place, but they need to make sure that uh, they have certain suppliers who can provide oxygen in the mountains. If they need a doctor, they, so they know where the doctors are located in the mountains. And in case that a, a rescue helicopter is needed, which most of the cases is needed, uh, they have all the elements, all the procedures to get a rescue helicopter as soon as possible. So the suppliers are key because especially oxygen, a rescue helicopter is needed. So the service provider need to know when, how uh, to get to those uh, suppliers and how to get the oxygen and the helicopter services. But the service provider also knew that uh, it's not only about having good providers, sorry, good uh, suppliers and have a uh, good processes. People is key, is extremely important. So it's not only about the guy taking the lead and helping that person in, in, in with the edema. You need to make sure that the porters are willing to help, that if you need an evacuation with porters, some of the porters speak English because likely that person uh, that is being evacuated might need to communicate certain things. So there's some kind of preparation with the, with the teams and with the people who are involved in this incident. And finally, they look after the information. If uh, there are two, two key parts here, if the service provider calls a helicopter, a rescue helicopter to get that person, if the service provider doesn't provide the insurance details to the helicopter, the helicopter won't fly. All that you have three to $2,008 cash. So, the service provider needs to make sure that they have the right information from each of the customer with insurance details. And if that person is unconscious, that he can, the service provider can provide medical history in case that that person goes to Kathmandu and needs medical treatment. So information is key because you may have the, the you may have all the other parts in place, but if you don't have the information, the helicopter might not come, your service might not be restored, and that person might have complications. So that's why this area is important, and they have certain a uh, uh, processes and procedures in place to make sure that, that information is available at any time. So it's interesting here that we see how an organization in Nepal who do very little IT, they're providing a service of taking people to the mountains, they're using elements of ITO4, specifically the um, four dimensions of service management to deal with incidents. So it's, it, it really proves that uh, you don't need very idle IT complex uh, scenarios to use this. In the very simple scenarios, those are very useful as well. But moving on, um, I show you how those services um, were supported by the, with an example of the incidents uh, in the Himalayas. And well, basically me as a client, the next step is how the product and service is, is delivered. What I can see, what I can going to experience um, as a client. So in this case, it was me being at Everest Base Camp. So this is a picture at Base Camp uh, with all the flags and the beautiful decoration that they have there. 
But it was not only that for me. For me, it was also making sure that I had good places to take nice pictures with nice, with nice landscapes in the background. For me, it was important also to walk to those the suspension bridges that you see in the Everest film um, that it was very famous a few years ago. Also get to know the culture a bit more. So understanding those temples, monuments, what do they mean by having them, some of the traditions in, in Nepal and so on. Dangerous airports, as I said, a beautiful uh, nights, a clear nights so where you can see the stars. Helicopter rides, but that's a different story for a different occasion. And it's all about sharing with people, get to know them, understand what they do, they understand their struggles, their happiness, and all this interaction with the, with the local people. So now this takes us to the last uh, step in the service value chain, which is value. And here what we want to answer the question is, was value co-created? Because as I said, in item four, we are centered, we are centered to look into value co-creation. And where, whatever we do, we need to make sure that this is co-creating value. Otherwise, we shouldn't be doing that. And people could claim, well, you know, Luis, you made it to the base camp and the service provider got paid. So yeah, there was a value realization there. In a sense, yes, we could claim that, but it's important to understand that for me, value was not only make it to, to the base camp. For me, value was defined as make it on time back to London because I didn't want to miss my flight because otherwise I will have to pay additional fees. I may have problems with work and so on. Secondly, be healthy. I didn't want to struggle. I didn't want to make it to to, to the top and then uh, having a helicopter to take me back uh, to Kamadu because I was very weak. Not for me, it was very important to be in good condition and be healthy. And also was very important uh, photography. I like photography a lot and I wanted to have very beautiful shots of the Himalayas. And the service provider understood that. So they made sure that uh, they were not only going to take me to the mountain, but I could have beautiful places for the pictures that was going to be healthy and that uh, we were going to do it in the right pace. We're not going to have any delays. In the contrast, the service provider wanted to get paid for sure, but there were other elements that were equally, I would say equally important to them. One of them is TripAdvisor. A review in TripAdvisor is gold in Himalayas. And if you have a bad review, you're already out of competition. It's a really competitive market that reviews in TripAdvisor make a big difference. So for them, having a good review was key. And when I told you in the previous slide about the helicopter ride, that was a different story. In fact, the service provider incurred extra cost to provide a helicopter because a flight was delayed for us. Because they knew that if they keep us happy, they would have a good review on TripAdvisor. In fact, we were eight people. And that means, um, a, that means um, a good review for them means future business uh, for them. And not only not only reviews, also uh, <laughs> oh, hey, there's somebody somebody on mute. Oh, yeah. Just making noise. Could you please go on mute if uh, if you're not speaking, please? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, um, sorry Luis. That's fine. Uh, that happens. Uh, the other part for them was that me as a person, I might recommend to my friends, to my family, to do a track with them. So that means future business for them, and. All the noise that I can make in social media. So of course getting paid for them was important, but for them was more important good reviews and potential new customers that they have in the future because they know that's more valuable. They know that they can make more revenues and more money out of that and not from one transaction it was me. So yes, value was co-created, but the value co-creation went beyond me being in, in, in base camp and them getting the amount that they got paid. It goes beyond that and only by interacting with the service provider and the customer is when you get to understand the importance of that. I understood how important for them is to have a, a good review and TripAdvisor, and that's why I was willing to do one because I know that's going to help them. So that's all, that's at the end of my presentation. But before that, I just want to say two things. First of all, as a conclusion, we can clearly see that ITIL goes beyond IT. In, in ITIL, the IT component is, 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 is important but it's all about service management. As long as you're providing a service, if it's involved in IT or not, ITIL elements are going to be useful. We speak about incidents, when you have a, a incidents with IT systems, but as we said, in the mountains, with no IT equipment at all, 
you also have incidents. And the incidents could be that a jack an animal push you and then you uh, injure one of your legs. So one of the um, something that I want to share with you, or, or, or uh, how do you say it, uh, that word? I want you to question if your organization is adopting ITIL outside IT. If not, there's something that you might want to consider because if you're any, any service that your organization is doing outside IT, elements of ITIL will be helpful for sure. And secondly, if one day you want to do this trek, I highly recommend this organization. First of all, because I did it with them, but mainly because they're using ITIL4. So I'm sure you're in this IT service management, you will be happy to do it with, with the organization that is using ITIL4. Excellent people, um, wonderful experience, not too expensive. Um, you can trust them. So yeah, if you want to do this uh, um, activity, I highly recommend this uh, organization. And that's the end of my presentation. Um, uh, just in time, and I hope you enjoyed the, uh, this presentation. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, everybody. And Mark, back to you.